Do you remember sitting here three weeks ago? We sat in this very sanctuary. Do you remember that? We sat here and together enacted the passion story. Do you remember that? Do you remember what you said? Do you remember what you said when Pilate asked, whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus, Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? What did you say? Jesus, Barabbas. And when Pilate said, well then, what shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? What did you... And when Pilate was at his wit's end and wanted to know what evil had this man done, what did you all shout? What did you all shout? Those are horrible words. Horrible words that came from your mouths. Crucify him! Crucify him! This is Jesus, Lord and Savior, whom we crucified. That's our story. It's a story that not only ends in death, but is bound from start to finish in death. It's a story about the systems of the world that dwell in torture and death and evil. A world that tells us the guilty will never be anything but guilty, that people do not change, that the only solution for evil is death. Death is the final word for all of the world's problems and nothing else will suffice. And these words, these words, this Lord Jesus, whom you crucified, are particularly poignant, coming from the mouth of Peter. Peter, who stood by and watched that day as Jesus was accused and condemned and killed, and yet Peter said nothing. He said nothing, for even Peter bought into the story that in order to preserve the self, one has to look the other way from evil that would kill an innocent man. That's the story we live, a story grounded in death, a story about looking the other way from the evil systems of the world. And our chant continues as we're complicit in that story. Crucify him! Crucify him! This week in Oklahoma City, most of us probably didn't notice it, Clayton Lockett was put to death by the Department of Corrections. Now, Clayton Lockett was not an innocent man. He was guilty of killing a 19-year-old girl. But the details of his death are horrendous. He was tasered. He had to be restrained. He endured collapsed veins and numerous, numerous bungled attempts to execute him. And finally, he died in front of witnesses who called out for his death, crucify him, crucify him, for death is our answer to evil culturally. It's the story we live. Even we get caught up in the hysteria of the crowd. Capital punishment is the only solution for crime. There's not enough to go around, so we have to cut welfare benefits. Somebody might try to take away our guns, so we better arm ourselves. Lazy people aren't going to get a job anyway. We might as well cut their benefits. Death is the story we live. Nothing else will suffice. Two weeks ago, we sat here in the sanctuary 
and we cried out for the crucifixion of a man who did deeds of power, who forgave sins, who fed the hungry, who welcomed the stranger. He did signs, healing the sick and raising the dead. He was the one appointed by God to be raised up and receive the Holy Spirit. This is the one we destined for death. Nothing else would suffice. And Peter has no trouble in his Pentecost sermon reminding us of our guilt, of our shame, of our willful disobedience. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. And three weeks later, we, like those to whom Peter preached, ask, then what are we to do? For this is not the story that we as a community want to live into. This is not the final word we want to utter. It breaks our hearts and burns our guts. And so for us, God has an answer. Out of the death of Christ, God brought new life, not only resurrection for Jesus, but for all of us. God's answer to us is repent and be baptized. Repent, turn to face the God of life. The God, the merciful God who has all manner of good things to offer us. Forgiveness of sins, life abundance, the giving of the Holy Spirit, the name child of God. Repentance means to turn and face the one, the only one who can grant us grace and salvation and forgiveness and life. It means looking squarely into the cross, to the face of Christ, and finding the source of our being, the source of everything we need. It's only in the cross of Christ that we are able to look past death and find promise. Nothing else will suffice. So what then should we do? How do we live into this reality. I mean, it's so easy to live in the realities of a world that doesn't trust or love, a world that finds in death the final word. We all know how that works. But how do we live into the reality of life abundant? We look first to the disciples, those who devoted themselves to teaching and fellowship, to time spent together lifting one another up in prayer, learning from the law and the prophets and the witness of one another, learning to forgive and love one another in the process of studying together and living together and praying together. They devoted themselves to gathering around the meal where Jesus serves as both host and guest. They devoted themselves to feasting around the word of grace and the table of grace. And from those practices, they were then able to go out into the world where they confronted the systems of the world, religious and secular, with words of, and deeds of power. Men, men who had been rendered fearful and silent at the foot of the cross, now proclaimed its power. Men who had been locked behind closed doors now opened doors so that all could enter and know Christ crucified as risen Lord and Savior. Men who feared for their lives now set tables of grace to give life to the poor and the needy. They were sent to bear witness to the power of God in Christ. And sometimes they stumbled over their words, and sometimes they paid a huge penalty, some even with their very lives. And sometimes they spoke to foreigners or women or challenged authority. Sometimes they went to places unknown, but their witness was always the same. This Jesus, who was crucified and killed, 
God raised him up and freed him from death. This Jesus who was crucified and killed, God raised him up and freed him from death. Our story now. It's the reason we do what we do. It's the reason we don't look to weapons or politics or the systems of this world for life. Some of us will walk this afternoon because God's children are hungry and we are called to feed them. Some of us cleaned up the streets of Greece or our church camp last week because God gave us a creation to delight in and it's our call to care for it. Some of us build houses in our neighborhoods because Jesus tells us to clothe the naked and shelter the homeless. We pray Because the kingdom of God doesn't come with weapons or death, but in prayer and obedience. We give our tithes and our offerings because there are people hurting and distressed and suffering around the globe, and we can't be in all places at all times, but our church body can. We do these things and so much more because resurrection life is the final word, not death, And resurrection life is for all people and nothing else will suffice. We live out resurrection life by looking at the cross. By looking to the outstretched arms of our Savior. And we stretch out our arms in response to heal a broken world. This Jesus, whom we crucified has loved us to death, has forgiven every nail driven into his body, every lash of the whip, every curse uttered. This Jesus whom we crucified has loved us to death and called us into this community of faith to be his body in the world offering healing and reconciliation in his name. This Jesus whom we crucified, he has loved us unto death and joined us to himself in the waters of baptism where he's freed us from sin and death once and for all. This Jesus whom we crucified, he's fed us with his body and granted us to sit in his presence at the table of grace with all people from all times and all places. This Jesus whom we crucified has called us to be a people of life, a people of grace, a people of love, a people of forgiveness. Nothing else will suffice. Amen.